Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We finished the first two. We're beginning the third. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3. At the end of chapter 2, Jesus was in the grain fields. The Pharisees were following him. They watched his disciples pick grain and eat the grain. They were hungry. And they accused them of breaking the Sabbath. And so they had a discussion on the Sabbath. Well, that discussion continues into chapter 3. And we read, he entered again into a synagogue. And a man was there whose hand was withered. They were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. Not long ago I came across a word that I thought interesting. Heliotropism. It's not a word you're going to have to use in life, perhaps, but it's a combination of two Greek words, sun and turning. Helios, sun, trope, turn. It describes plants. Ancient Greeks observed that plants moved toward light. At night, they are randomly positioned. But at dawn, flowers turn to the east and they follow the sun to the west. That's a phenomenon well known to botanists, but I found a parable in it. Flowers move irresistibly to natural light, but man moves away from spiritual light. Flowers and all of nature are more obedient to God and his natural laws than men are to his spiritual laws. Man's obedience doesn't rise to the level of the flowers or a donkey. Isaiah recognized that. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. What an indictment on man's guilt. John explained it simply in the third chapter of his gospel. Men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. And Mark gives an example of that very thing in the third chapter of his gospel when men, religious men, who had seen the Lord's light and knew his deeds, tried to destroy him. Their deeds were evil. They had been doing this almost from the beginning of our Lord's public ministry. They attacked him first for forgiving sin, then for not fasting, then they accused his disciples of breaking the Sabbath. What the Pharisees considered Sabbath breaking was not keeping their traditions and taboos for the seventh day. Jesus corrected them by explaining the intent of the Sabbath, which was rest. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It was not intended to be a burden, but a blessing. And he knew that. And he spoke this way with authority because he said he was Lord of the Sabbath. That exchange in chapter 2 occurred in a grain field. The next one occurred in a synagogue where again... It was about the Sabbath and work. The Pharisees interpreted work broadly. 
Picking grain on Saturday was, according to them, doing the work of a farmer and prohibited. Healing was doing the work of a physician, so it was prohibited. This particular Sabbath was an opportunity for testing Jesus on that issue because in the synagogue was a man with a withered hand. The Pharisees were there and they were watching. This was the neediest man in the congregation. They knew that he would attract the Lord's attention and anticipated that Jesus would heal him. Well, they judged the Lord correctly. He never missed an opportunity to do good and to help those in need. And that would then give them an opportunity, give them an excuse for accusing him of being a Sabbath breaker. That was their plan. Paul, uh, Mark makes it very clear in verse 2. They were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath that they might accuse him. So think of that. Just think of that. These were religious leaders. They knew Jesus could heal the sick. They knew that he could do miracles. They don't question that. But they weren't following him. They even intended to take advantage of his mercy and love to accuse and destroy him. That is an unbelieving heart. They were shepherds of souls, but had greater regard for their rules than for human welfare. They'd leave a man deformed for the sake of their traditions, ignore him rather than remove his pain and shame. That is a hard heart. This is one of the lessons here, how entrenched in unbelief and how hard the human heart really is. It's Pharisees who give us the example of this, but it's not just Pharisees. It's man. This is man in a fallen world. Men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. And that is all of us apart from God's grace. The other lesson is really the main one. It is how good the Lord is, how caring He is, how great His grace is. He shows that in the synagogue and again proves He is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is, Sabbath is the day of rest, and Jesus gives rest to the weary, He gives relief to the afflicted. He restores the broken. He is the salvation, the Sabbath pictures. In Matthew's account of this incident, the Pharisees were more aggressive than seen here in Mark. They were not only watching to see if Jesus would heal, they pushed it. It was really kind of a case of entrapment. Uh, the Lord could see that. They, uh, he knew this man was there in the synagogue, and they, seeing him, as Matthew points out, whose hand was withered, saw their opportunity, so they asked Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? As I said, this was entrapment. They were, they were, they were baiting him, but the Lord knew that. He knows all. He knows what was in their hearts. He knew what they were doing, but he was not a pugnacious man. That is, he was not a man who looked for fights, just the opposite. He was the Prince of Peace. But neither was he a man to back down from a challenge when it involved the truth or when it involved doing good, and this did. So he responded to their question by asking the man with the crippled hand to stand up and come forward. Then he asked them, the Pharisees, a question. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or kill? Well, he knew it was in their hearts. He knew they had murder in their hearts on the Sabbath. The answer was obvious. It's an obvious answer. Since there's no law against doing good on any day of the week, it's always lawful to do good. In fact, it would be wrong to refuse to do good when it was within a person's power to help. How could they object to that? He had turned their question 
against them, and they knew that. But they wouldn't admit to error. So <clears throat> they didn't answer. They kept silent. And it was that, it was their silence, not really their question, it was their silence that really provoked the Lord. He looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. It was the anger of righteousness, the kind of anger that a person feels when he or she sees evil. And the Lord, who is the searcher of hearts, knew what evil was in their hearts, murder toward him, and indifference for the suffering man, and all of that for their religion, for their traditions. But his anger was tempered by his grief. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. In fact, his grief was more enduring than his anger. The tenses of the verbs indicate that. He, his look of anger is in the aorist tense, which is a simple past. It means punctiliar action, happens in a moment. But his grief is in the present tense. That's durative, that's continuing. So the look of anger was a flash. The grief continued throughout the incident. But brief as it was, what must that glance of anger have been like for those callous Pharisees? What would they have felt under that righteous gaze? We get a sense of it perhaps from the vision John had of our Lord on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation chapter 1 where he is described, where Paul, uh, John describes the appearance of this one who was behind him and spoke to him and had the voice of many waters and he looks around and he sees this magnificent, glorious, awesome vision of the Lord. And he says that his eyes were like a flame of fire. It's symbolism, of course, but the meaning is he sees with complete clarity and absolute purity, and what he sees he judges with perfect righteousness, and he is the judge of all the earth. His eyes are like a flame of fire. They were in the synagogue that day. They were piercing. They read the Pharisees' hearts who felt the heat and were in the light and didn't like it. Still, it wasn't the anger but the grief that stayed with the Lord. Their hardness of heart had had made them the real losers. And that too is what he saw in them. He had answered them with a convincing and compelling rhetorical question. Is it lawful to do good? Of course it is. That is so basic. They knew that. They should have yielded to it. But their hearts were so hard and they were so spiritually blind that they refused to yield to, yield to an answer that was obvious. Spurgeon said, they were thus determined and resolutely destroying their own souls out of hatred for him. And he was angry more for their sake than for his. What a tragedy it was for him to witness men, his own creation, willfully damning themselves out of personal pride and selfishness because they loved the darkness rather than the light. And these men knew the Bible. The Gospel of John, Jesus speaks to them and says, you search the Scriptures because you think you have life in them. And they did. They searched the Scriptures. They knew the Bible. They knew the prophecies. They knew the promises. They should have known that the things they were witnessing in the life of Jesus in history were signs of fulfillment that the Messiah had come. The Son of God was among them. They had already witnessed the great miracles that He had done, how He had healed the lame man in chapter 2. So how does a heart become so hard and resistant to the truth? Well, the answer is unbelief. Now you might think, well, that's somewhat circular, isn't it? Isn't it? Our unbelief is caused by our unbelief. But no, it's not. Just as faith leads to greater faith and receives light 
When it does, it receives more light, it gets more knowledge. The more we receive, the more we get, the more we believe, the more we understand and believe. Well, at the same time, unbelief results in the opposite process. The stronger the unbelief, the greater the resistance to, tr to the truth, the deeper the darkness. These men knew the Bible and rejected it. The Bible's very clear. It's very clear. From Genesis 15, we have Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That's Paul's great text in the book of Romans, as you remember. Justification is through faith alone. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in the object of salvation, who is Christ alone. Now that was clear from the Old Testament long before the law was ever given. It was clear. A man, a woman, a person is justified through his or her faith. And yet these men who knew the Bible were legalists. That is, they believed in earning merit with God by doing the works of the law and obeying the traditions of men. They'd added that, and really it was especially the traditions that they looked to. And they had become hardened. This is what natural religion, ritual, formalism produces. It's lifeless. Jesus defied that, denied all of that. They knew that. So for the sake of their religion to protect it, they wanted to destroy him. This is the fruit of, this is the result of the natural man practicing his religion, a works religion. But it is also very unnatural, completely contrary to how God created us to be. Probably few today have read St. Augustine's most famous book, The Confessions. But most people are at least familiar with his prayer to God on the first page. You have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. And so it is. But the natural man refuses to rest in Christ. He will be restless until he does, but he'd rather be restless than rest in Christ because he is at war with him. He is hostile toward him. You think I'm being too harsh on man? Well, that's what Paul is teaching us. That's what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 about man. He is at enmity with God. He is at war with God. Not just Pharisees or Sadducees. All mankind is that way. The consequence of the fall. So while the hearts of these Pharisees were harder than most, still they give us a window on our own condition and show that for hard hearts to rest in Him, we need grace. This is universally the case in the human condition. The heart of man is dead and it is as hard as stone. That's the image that Ezekiel the prophet gives but he also prophesied that God would change hearts from stone to flesh, from dead to living. And Jesus shows that in his next act. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. So, with one command, Jesus answered the Pharisees' question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And on the face of it, the lesson of the passage is simple. Je Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath because He is Lord. He did what only God can do. He did a miracle. But more than that, this healing of a man with a withered hand, a dead hand, <clears throat> gives us a picture of salvation. And what the, what the Lord does in making the hard heart believing. This man was utterly helpless. And, and as far as we know, he didn't ask for help. He didn't seek out the Lord. He wasn't trying to gain healing. But Christ sought him out. Christ found him, called him, and told him to stretch out his hand. Which you think about that for a moment. That's the, that's the very thing he couldn't do. One might even think how cynical telling this man to do something he cannot do. His hand was like a 
dried up stick. It was dead. But he did it. He stretched forth his hand. That's salvation. Now after the first service, I had a complaint from a good friend who meant well, Mr. Black. <clears throat> and we went back to the back and he shook his head and said, oh, you missed it. You missed your opportunity. Said, okay, what was that? He said, you should have pointed out that this man's hand was so withered, so dead, he could not have played for the TCU Frogs. I'm an alumnus. We got some others here too. And last night, they missed their opportunity to go to the College World Series when they got beat two to nothing by the Florida Gators. But he's right. This man couldn't have played. As he pointed out, he couldn't swing a bat. He couldn't throw a ball. He couldn't catch a ball. He couldn't do anything. That's how dead this man's hand was. So have I improved my sermon? I hope so. I hope that's <laughs> helpful. But it's true. He couldn't have played for TCU or anyone else. But after the Lord dealt with him, he could have thrown a no-hitter for anybody. Now that's grace. That's God's grace that, that overwhelms man's inability, overwhelms his indifference to the truth, overwhelms man's rebellion against God to bring people to knowledge and faith and to rest in the Lord. The gospel has that power within it. He taught man's total... He, he gave he, that truth of the power of the, of, God, of, the, of the gospel is in the book of Romans. Paul makes that point. That's what he says. It is the power of God for salvation, Romans 1.16. The power is not in us. The power is not even in our preaching. We resist the light by nature. The power is in the Lord and His Word. Now, St. Augustine made that point as well. He taught man's total inability to believe and turn to the light apart from God's grace. He taught that in his book, The Confessions. I mentioned a, a moment ago that people today haven't read that book. Most people haven't. But when he wrote it, everyone read it. It was his spiritual biography. It was unique at the time. It set a standard. And it was a bestseller. One man who read it was a British monk named Morgan. Morgan came to Rome where he had an influential ministry under his Latin name, Pelagius. Morgan, or Pelagius, was a moralist. He had a very different background from Augustine. Augustine had been saved out of a willful, sinful life when he had come really to the end of himself in a garden in Milan. But Pelagius was raised within the quiet walls of the monastery. He didn't see much of the activity and corruption of mankind. He lived a moral life. He denied original sin. He believed that man was good and had it in him to live a perfect life. All he must do is do it, follow the commandments. Man is able. Now, he didn't deny grace. But his idea of grace wasn't the new birth or empowerment from the Holy Spirit, but a rational mind. God has been gracious to us. He's given a mind that can understand everything that is revealed. He wouldn't reveal it if we couldn't understand it. And his grace is seen in the commandments which he's given. God, he taught, gave man only commandments that he could obey. And that seems self-evident to Pelagius. Why would God give us commandments, tell us to obey them, when we can't obey them? It made no sense to him. So in his mind, the very presence of the Ten Commandments and all the commandments in Scripture were the evidence that man must have a natural ability to believe and obey and obey to such an extent that he can be perfect. So just do it. Well, that was Pelagian's theology in the 4th century. It was very prominent. 
And the Pelagian theology of the fourth century is really the theology of many modern evangelicals. Surely they think man has the natural ability to believe the gospel. Why would God give us the gospel and say believe it when we can't believe it? it makes no sense. We must have the ability in and of ourselves to understand the light, to come to it on our own, to believe. That's the Pelagianism of today. Well, Pelagius read Augustine's Confessions and got very upset when he came to the latter part of the book in chapter 10 and read the prayer, command what you will, but give what you command. In other words, Lord, I cannot obey. I haven't the will or power to do it, but if you, O oh God, give me the ability, I can do it. Then command whatever you wish, because I, you have given me the power to do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, as Paul said. Pelagius hated that. In fact, he became so angry over it that he almost got into a fistfight with someone who repeated it to him in a discussion. So much for Pelagius' perfection. He believed in the sovereignty of man, not the sovereignty of God. Certainly not total depravity, which is maybe better called total inability. And so that began one of the greatest debates in the history of the church, which still goes on to this day. The fight over free will and the bondage of the will. Now, if this miracle in Mark 3 is a picture of salvation, as I think it is, of how salvation occurs, then it shows that man, the sinner, is naturally of himself incapable of turning to the light. He will not. But that doesn't mean the sinner can't believe. <clears throat> Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield put it this way, the doctrine of inability does not affirm that we cannot believe, but only that we cannot believe in our own strength. Christ calls the lost and restless through the gospel and gives the faith for the helpless sinner to respond. We can put it even more strongly. He arrests the rebel in the midst of his rebellion with weapons in his hand and subdues him with the new birth. That's what God did to Saul of Tarsus who was as determined to destroy Jesus Christ, at least erase the name of Jesus from the thoughts of men and to kill his disciples as ready and glad to do that as these Pharisees in the synagogue were. But the Lord sought him when he wasn't seeking the Lord. He shined his light on Saul, spoke to him, called him to faith, and there on the Damascus road, Paul was born again and commissioned, made to be the great apostle to the Gentiles. Preacher of grace. Sovereign grace. Well, this is sovereign grace. Sovereign grace overcomes willful unbelief, and heart, the hardest of hearts. It is grace that makes the unwilling willing. It is grace that makes the unable able, that makes a heart of stone one of flesh. That's what was demonstrated in the synagogue in Mark 3 when Jesus told the man, stretch out your hand. The very thing he could not do, but the thing he did. The hand that was dead moved. Dr. Warfield commented, commented, in light of this miracle, we are justified in saying to every distressed sinner, act against sin in Christ's name as if you had strength and you will find you have. The reason is, God commands what He wills and gives while He commands. The gospel of Jesus Christ has that kind of power in it. The Holy Spirit gives life through the preaching of the Word of God. You won't find that in any other writing. Any book of man, that's not true. 
This book is unique. This book is supernatural. This message is life-giving. The Spirit of God works through it to change people. Well, through His Word He did. A wonderful miracle occurred in the synagogue. A dead hand was given life. And it would be a happy ending to read, would it not? The Pharisees' eyes were opened. They believed and followed Jesus. But we don't have that ending. Instead, we read, <clears throat> The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Now, if that doesn't demonstrate that man is naturally at war with God, what will? They weren't, they weren't even happy for the hapless man whose hand had been so brilliantly restored. In fact, the miracle made them even more determined in their resolve to kill Jesus, so much so that they entered into an alliance with the Herodians. Now, the Pharisees had almost nothing in common with the Herodians. They were a secular party. They were allies of King Herod, who was a secular, profane man and a friend of Rome. But since the Lord was from Galilee, he was Herod's subject. Herod was the king of that region. And so it would be important for the Pharisees to turn Herod against him. And the Herodians, for their part, wanted to maintain the political status quo. They wanted to keep everything as it was. They didn't want anybody rocking the boat, which Jesus' popularity seemed perhaps to threaten and to do. And so the two entered into an unlikely, what may seem an unholy, alliance and yet they were willing to lay aside their differences. They were willing to, to do that for the purpose of getting rid of the one that they thought was a threat to them both. They were thinking, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And they both had a common enemy they believed in Jesus. And there is a sense in which it was true. He was a threat to them. He was a threat to both of them, to their error in which they both lived, the legalism of the Pharisees and the materialism of the Herodians. But the idea that Christ was a real threat and dangerous man was a false one. The paths both had taken, the Pharisees, the Herodians, were paths leading to destruction. And Christ came to save men from that. He came as light and came shining His light on men and on their ways, exposing them, exposing their error to bring them to truth. But men love their darkness rather than the light. Man needs, men and women need a spiritual heliotropus. Heliotropism needs to take place in their lives in a spiritual sense so that they will do what even the flowers do. Turn to the light God has given them. Ultimately, only God can cause that to occur. Thankfully, thankfully He does that. Jeremiah said, Turn me and I shall be turned. Give me repentance and I will repent. He will do that for everyone who desires it. In fact, he turned Paul when he didn't desire it, when he wasn't seeking it, when he was a Pharisee. In fact, many of the religious leaders were ultimately brought to faith in Christ. Did you know that? Luke speaks of that in Acts chapter seven, verse, uh, Acts chapter six, verse seven. A great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. That's astonishing. In light of what we read here, that's sovereign grace. And it is what you have experienced if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. And it should give you a great sense of gratitude. That's one reason it is so important that we understand our genuine, our true condition. 
It may be insulting when one first hears about it. Here's this expression, total depravity, total inability, complete guilt, all of that. But we will never understand the grace of God if we don't understand that from which he has saved us and what he has done for us. It should give you, give me, give all of us a great sense of gratitude. Now, that's certainly one of the applications of this passage to us. That should be our response because we were really no different from those Pharisees in the synagogue. But there are other lessons for us from those Pharisees because even we who have, by God's grace, turned to the light of Jesus Christ, we who have been saved can resemble them. They were in a synagogue, a place where the Bible was read when their hearts were far from the God of the Bible. The Lord saw their hearts. What does he see in our hearts in church? That's a question I confess that's uh, disturbing to me personally. My, my heart is not always where it should be. Whether it's here or when I'm on my knees in prayer, I find my, my mind drifting. What does he see when he looks into our, our hearts? Because the mind can drift. It can go from things completely off the subject, different from God, while we're in the house of God. It's very easy to be here, but not really be here. To be here physically, but mentally and spiritually, be somewhere else, on the golf course, at the office, doing some other thing. And God's word is ignored. Now that is dangerous. It is a kind of formalism, ritualism, which we're going through ourselves. We're going through motions. We're here because, well, we should be here, but we're not really yielding our hearts and minds to Christ. That is the beginning of spiritual drift and then spiritual failure. The author of Hebrews warned a congregation of that, really quoting David. So it's the warning of the Old and the New Testament alike. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. We must guard against that and ask God to revive our spirits and our love for him. That should be our daily prayer. And then some of you may be no different at all from those Pharisees. It's possible to be in church and be an unbeliever just as possible as it was to be in the synagogue and an unbeliever. Maybe you like being in church because you, you feel it's a good thing to do. I mean, what could be better for you than going to church? Maybe you're here because you think, well, if I come, maybe it'll earn me some favor with God. I, that can't hurt. But if you have not put your faith in Christ, being in church means nothing. Maybe you're exposed to the light and that hardens your heart even more. But it won't save you to simply be in church. That occurs only by recognizing that you are a sinner in need of the Savior and trusting in Him. And you know what? That's all one must do. Look to Christ. Trust in Him. That's the good news. It's not by works, it's through faith alone. And the good news also is he receives all who do. Everyone who trusts in him is received. So if you're here without him, turn to him. Trust in him. And you who have, live for him with gratitude and thanksgiving. May God help us all to do that. Well, let's end with a hymn. And the Songs of Praise book, hymn 23, a hymn I really like, Before the Throne of God Alone, and then remain standing for the benediction. Father, we say amen to that. He is our Savior and our God. We thank you for sending him into the world to become a man and die in our place. May we live for him, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.